well it's a shame not to be in your lovely clubhouse but um at least we're um we're all together here on this rather strange strange system sorry about all that trouble to begin with one of those little glitches um yeah as jessica says we'll probably have a little interruption at eight o'clock so we can all blow our whistles and clap and all of that but, um i don't know if anyone here has sailed to the arctic or planning to do such a thing um maybe the rest of you are just after a kind of inspirational talk um well you're going to get an inspirational talk but it's uh it's an inspirational talk type b so you get the kind of the inspirational talk type a which is tales of daring do and technical know-how and and all of that kind of stuff and this is a different type this is the inspirational talk type b which is kind of leaves you with the um my god if that plonker can do that in that boat maybe maybe i can do something in my boat so it's your it's a type b inspirational talk you're going to have um it uh, it's going to last for about an hour and 13 minutes so i hope you've all got a beer to hand and such like um <laughs> who am i i'm i'm certainly no expert sailor the last race i i partake partook in um i had to get on the vhf to call the the um, race committee to say that i was still kind of on my way and i was so late that the race committee said they all had to get their last trains back to glasgow and that i should book in with the harbour master so i'm certainly no expert sailor um indeed i'm no expert climber either um and then um and then there's my boat um oh just oh i've got a little technical problem here mm. ah here we go that seemed to work um so um yeah, my boat is only a 26 foot long um, Virtue, so she's not your kind of typical Arctic sailing boat. Um, she was designed in 1936 by Jack Laurent Giles, um, very noteworthy for their seaworthiness, um, but certainly not your kind of typical 40 foot steel aluminium type job you would normally take up into the ice. But um, Nevertheless, for some strange reason, I got uh, got slightly hooked on this sailing north idea. Mm. Yeah. So these are the voyages that I've been on, um, mainly in in Sumara. I did one in a, in another boat that we'll talk about later. So tonight I'm going to talk. Um, can you see this on the screen? Yes, you can. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my voyage up to Svalbard, to Spitsbergen, but that was kind of pre-digital time, so I don't have very good photos and things. So we're going to concentrate more on the trip I did in 2011 to Jan Mayen, um, an attempt at Greenland and back. And then finally, a little short thing about the sail I did last year in a boat to East Greenland. So how did it all start? Well, strangely enough, it started in Antigua. Um, I was sailing over there and I was on my boat by myself and um, I was kind of invited to join this classic boat regatta. I borrowed some Norwegian crew from another boat. So this is us three sailing in the regatta. And they, and they were saying that they have a fantastic wooden boat festival in Resor in southern Norway. And that I would I would really enjoy it. Um, so you can imagine their kind of shock or, or dismay when I actually turned up there the following summer and um, and joined in their regatta. Um, and it was indeed a fantastic regatta with some really hairy racing between rocks and things. It was extremely exciting and it was indeed certainly sailing north but southern Norway is hardly the Arctic. Um, but during a quiet moment, I started to browse through the Norwegian pilot book and um, 
and then I saw pictures of uh, glaciers and polar bears and of course that was my arctic seed was sown I had to go and see these polar bears. So my top tip number one is it's dangerous to browse through these pilot books you're, you're going to get hooked onto something that um, you weren't expecting. So this was the um, <clears throat> The route, as I say, it was kind of before the days of digital cameras. So um, I'm not going to spend too long talking about this. But the, this was a summer holiday. So now I look back on it, it was it was a pretty ambitious little summer holiday plan. So it's going to start with a trip from South Dock Marina, direct one and a half, no, one thousand one hundred miles to the um, Lofoten Islands. Now. As someone who normally stops off in Queenborough on the way to Ramsgate, I'm not quite sure why I suddenly decided to sail 1,100 miles up the North Sea to Wren on the stop. But in any case, that's what I, I decided to do. And then we hacked through these islands to Tromso. Um, oh, we just jumped on. Any case, well, here we go. So we arrived in. Um, we arrived in the Lofoten Islands. We we hit one gale going up the North Sea. Got pooped, but wasn't too wasn't too bad. Um, on the way into the Lofoten Islands, you pass a thing called the Maelstrom. Um, now the Maelstrom is the thing that um, Edgar Allan Poe he he wrote in the Descent to the Maelstrom. He said, "You suppose me to be a very old man, but I'm not." It took less than a single day to change these hairs from jetty black to white, to weaken my limbs, to unstring my nerves so that I tremble at the least exertion. I am frightened at a shadow. So our problem with the Maelstrom was that we were running out of diesel. It was rather strange. We entered the Arctic in dead calm, wearing shorts and t-shirts. It was really warm. Um, and we were chugging by really worried that we were going to suddenly stop at the maelstrom but we didn't and this was our port of arrival as you can see it was um built by disney um that lovely cgi mountain in the background it's very realistic um from from the lafoons we we wiggled our way up through the islands up to tromso now, Tromso is often called the Paris of the North, but um, God knows why. So here, here we are. So this was our port of arrival at Rennes. We went through all of these little islands here to Tromso, then up to the North Cape and then Bear Island. Note the position here of Hornsund, which is where we arrived. And this is the main town, Longyearbyen. Um, we anchored, we sailed up from Tromso to Bear Island, uh, just there. And we anchored for a night, but a, an oncoming gale was coming in. So we had to kind of flee in the morning. It's a really godforsaken place, Bear Island. So this is us, we arrived in Hornsund. Actually, we arrived in thick fog and it gradually lifted up. It was really lovely to see the view. Um, we anchored using a CQR anchor, um, which was what we used in those days. And we, we dug it in. And of course, we'd just arrived in our kind of, in Spitsbergen, which was our celebration kind of place. So we, we went down below and we opened up a bottle of red wine and put the frayed bentos in the in the oven and um, put on the ever spasher for a bit of heat. So we were just sitting down with a glass of red wine thinking, oh, fantastic. I mean, it's absolutely heavenly. And suddenly the boat canted over to one side. And then we heard the anchor chain kind of dragging across the seabed. And then and then we heard claws clawing at the side of the boat and we thought oh my god it's a bloody polar bear you know we've only just arrived so we had this kind of mad panic to get we had a rifle that was strapped to the mast and we kind of panicked to 
get that off and then we had to find the ammunition and such like we went to the um pull up the the um washboards to to face the face the foe um and um i need to see this rather lovely bearded seal massive fat thing normally very shy animals but um in this case it took a fancy to the fine lines of the virtue um obviously a seal with excellent taste so we swapped our rifle for a camera and um took some little shots now it does bring a, a kind of a, a good point about arctic sailing is it the normal thing to do when you sail to Svalbard is to sail up to Longyearbyen, in the main town um, and hire a gun but that means you can't stop at Hornsund or Belsund you know good cruising ground before you get there and you might want to turn in there because of a gale or something um, and, and although that was a bearded seal in fact there were bears in the area so it could well have been a bear um, so a little tip is to try to take a gun with you but you know obviously um you need to get a license and it needs to be a high calibered rifle so it's quite a tricky thing to do so we got that bit right because we were carrying the rifle but um one of the one of the big mistakes we made on this spitzbergen trip and i I think it's worth bearing in mind with these kind of arctic trips is to try to avoid crew changes because we arranged a couple of crew changes from the airport at Longyearbyen on different dates which meant we could never really get too far north because we were always worried about being able to get back to the airport to pick up the um the crew there's no you know up in Svalbard you can't if you arrive at the airport that's where you are you can't get a bus anywhere or it's um in the in the winter you can go by skidoo but in the summer there's no way of getting around apart from by yacht so um yeah it's always a good idea to try and um uh, avoid crew changes if you can um <clears throat> Of course, if you're in Greenland and you mess up on a crew change, it's almost certainly going to involve a helicopter trip. Um, and that, that gets expensive as well. But of course, the big thing about going to the Arctic is you want to see a polar bear. And, and we were, luckily, we weren't disappointed. So this is our, our bear. I suppose another top tip would be to take a decent camera with a telephoto lens. But... This was in a place called Trighammer. Um, Ray and my crew went out to roll a cigarette at about four in the morning. It doesn't get dark, of course, so you get rather confused about time. Um, and a bear was swimming in the water nearby. And then he was climbing up onto these rocks and eating bird's eggs. So he was obviously pretty hungry. Um, we watched him for quite a while and then we went to bed and then in the morning we we um got up to make breakfast which happened to be a bacon sandwich it was rather a kind of smelly breakfast to make and then we decided we would row ashore to climb up that glacier um bit of an odd thing to decide to do really knowing that there was a bear in the area but that's what we did the the boat, of course, was anchored quite a long way away from the beach because the charts are pretty scanty. So you can't you can't risk going too close because um, you never know what you're going to hit. So it was quite a long row ashore. And we walked up the glacier and, of course, inevitably um, we saw the bear again. And the bear definitely saw us. He kind of eyeballed us. So we decided our best thing was to slip over the back of the glacier and do a runner down along the moraine back to our dinghy and then there was a bit of a debate at the dinghy whether we should <laughs> the dinghy back to the boat or stay on shore and try and fight it off there but we decided to um to go for the row and um, <laughs> it's the first time i've ever seen a, an avon dinghy with three men in it uh playing under oars 
it was a pretty spectacular trip back to the boat. Actually, talking of dinghies, it's well worth um, well worth getting a tough dinghy. Uh, ideally, something made of hypalon. The um, the volcanic rock is really really sharp up there, and if you did get a tear in your dinghy, you really would be quite stuffed because um, well, the only way back to the boat would be to swim. Um, <clears throat> any case we we cruised around the um spitsbergen area for a few weeks and then then it became time to leave and it, rather unusually i decided to leave by sailing direct to the faroe islands which is another thousand mile distance south kind of non-stop but, um, but while i was checking the route of course i had another little browse through those pilot books and i spotted this island of Jan Mayen. Yes, dangerous to browse those parts. So just a little reminder, so this is our little Hornsund, then up, spent a lot of time cruising around here into Belsund, and then this is our thousand mile trip down to the Faroe Islands, which are here. Uh, it was a truly appalling journey, um, but we did eventually arrive in Torshavn. The, the harbour master nearly choked when he asked where we had come from in our little varnished boat. But, um, the pharaohs, of course, aren't in the Arctic, but they are pretty fundamental to Arctic cruising because nearly all the boats that leave Scotland stop off in the pharaohs before heading off to Iceland or further north. Um, a really favourite place of mine, um, well worth a visit if you can get there. We helped crewing out, crewing on a, um, a tall ship for a while and then we sailed south back to Scotland. The boat was then wintered in Dunstaffnage and that was the end of a, um, uh, what was a pretty bonkers summer holiday really. But, um, uh, you might say we were lucky to have got away with it, but uh, as Roel Amundsen said, victory awaits him who has everything in order. Luck, we call it. Defeat is definitely due for him who has neglected to take the necessary precautions. Bad luck, we call it. Damn, um, there's a bit of truth in that. So, the um, Spitsbergen trip um, sated my, ap my um, appetite for adventure for a while, but that, um, that bloody Jan Mayen island that I'd spotted in the pilot book was going to need a visit. Um, so originally, <coughs> it was just to sail there, but then I had this kind of idea of climbing the massive volcano. Um, it was certainly going to be a grand adventure and um, it was time to start planning. Now, as planning is fun, it's a good idea not to rush things. And it, I, I would reckon you need to allow two or three years to plan a journey like this. The first and most important thing to do is to set a date because nothing ever happens unless you've fixed a date. Um, if someone says I'm going to sail around the world, you kind of think, oh yeah, bet you, bet you don't. If someone says I'm going to sail around the world and I'm leaving spring 2023 or something, it, it's a far more believable thing. They stand a better chance. So set set the date when you're going to do this adventure and then rough out an itinerary, um, and then and then gather your crew. Now. I found the good news is that the more diabolical the journey, the easier it is to find a crew, albeit diabolical crew. But, um, but, it, but it is true, if you want a crew to do some trip around the East Coast, it's a bit of a struggle to find anyone. But if you want to sail up into the Arctic, everyone sticks their hands up. Um, then go about trying to absorb everything you can about the area you're sailing to. Um, cut out newspaper articles, read history books, 
watch films, go to yacht club talks, um, do anything to kind of build up as much background as you possibly can about the, um, the place you're sailing to. And then, and then try and keep your crew well informed. Um, we did newsletters. Um, it was particularly important because the crew weren't all kind of local. We had crew coming from Scotland and Bristol and such like. So we didn't want them losing touch with what was going on. Um, yeah, then get yourself fit. Um, and, and ideally make sure the crew get fit too. And this is especially important if you're going to drag things up mountains. Um, climbing a mountain when you're exhausted is absolute hell. Um, but climbing one when you're fit is absolute heaven. So we entered half marathons, marathons, hill races, triathlons. We attended military fitness up on Blackheath um, and in fact most of the crew from that trip uh, have all become keen runners now. And then arrange crew meetings and these can be kind of you know a bit tongue-in-cheek really. You can hire rooms above pubs very cheaply, we, we even hired a part of the Greenwich Maritime Museum for one for one briefing they're great, they're great fun, a great excuse to have a beer with your mates. Um, you can discuss all the kit and draw up kit lists and such like. And then most importantly, um, test the kit. I mean, we, we took all our gear up into the Cheviots um, camping. I mean, that was, you see our little um, tent, a little campsite down there. It's just absolutely fantastic kind of walk-in holiday. Um, and then we went in the winter, we went <laughs> around the Brecon Beacons and, and got lost and such like. Alistair, um, sorry yeah. to disrupt you. Yeah. There's a question that uh, how yeah. high was the mountain as you were talking through? So. Uh, well, the Beerenberg mountain, we'll be, we'll be coming to that. Okay. Um, but, but it, <laughs> Patience. It's it's high up and high down. It will come up in a minute. So sure, thanks. Um, so yeah, so you can learn new skills. Um, we went off training in the Alps and we learnt uh, crevasse rescue. Um, you can learn to speak a bit of Norwegian. Um, learn how to use the sextant. Learn how to fillet a fish. Take a drawing class. Do first aid courses. There's loads of things that you can kind of add to the to the journey. Um, and then it's a good idea to integrate a shakedown cruise if you can into your plans. Um, and there are a few bits of kit that you might need on your boat which are kind of extra for Arctic cruising assuming your kit's already kitted out for normal cruising. But it, it's really important when you're going up into the Arctic to research each bit of kit thoroughly because you just can't afford to have kind of crap on board the boat. So uh, we've already talked about the, the shooter. Um, you didn't really need it for the Yan Mayan trip. Um, you certainly need it for Svalbard, you certainly need it for Greenland. It's got to be high caliber, it's got to stop a bear dead in its tracks. Um, it's no good kind of pussyfooting around with a low caliber rifle. Um, takes a long time to get a license you need to apply quick and early <laughs> this is one of my crew you don't have to wear the balaclava it's an optional optional extra um, heating it, it doesn't get that cold in the arctic in the summer it's you know about the same as winter over here so the the important thing about the heating is warm dry air so you can dry clothes off so a kind of an Eberspasha type heater is, is excellent. And if you can funnel it up into your oil skins, that's, um, that's perfect. Spray hood, you've probably got spray hoods in any case, pretty important to have somewhere you can stick your head in, in the bad weather up there. Um, heavy ground tackle, um, I upgraded from that CQR we took to Spitsbergen 
to um, to a rockner, 15 kilo. In fact, all the boats that um, there were three boats involved in this Yan Mayan expedition, and they all chose rockner anchors independently. Um, they really do grip like Billio. And um, as a kedge anchor, I took an aluminium fortress anchor. Also got good grip, but nice and light. Um, I carry a massive, a massive bronze chum as well, and a um, couple of hundred meters of 16 mil octoplat. Yeah, fishing tackle. There's loads of fish up there. Uh, cod just come. You just hang a hook over, and you get a cod up. So don't don't go with that fishing tackle. Ice poles are pretty important. Long, lightweight poles that you can stab the little bergy bits and push them away. Survival suits um, important for bad weather. The sea temperature up there is around three degrees. You would only survive for a few minutes if you fell in um, without a survival suit on. They serve other purposes as well, as well for getting ashore in rough weather. You can wear them in the dinghy. So if the dinghy gets tipped over, you can swim ashore and drag the dinghy up the beach. The crow's nest, well, yeah, um, that, that would be a joy. But it, really, you do need some way of getting up high to look down onto the ice. Not, not for your mine, but for East Greenland, it's pretty crucial. You might find um, a drone or um, some kind of GoPro camera up the mast to do the purpose. but. Um, if you can get up high, that's that's great. Satellite phone, highly recommended, mainly because you can then get daily ice charts. And without those, you're taking a few more risks than you need to. Waterproof kit bags, again, really good. If you're going ashore with climbing kit and things, if your kit bag's completely waterproof, if you get turfed out of the dinghy in the surf, at least you can you know you've got dry kit when you get on the on the land. So these were our Ortlieb duffel bags. These are completely waterproof. They float. You can use them as rucksacks. These were our survival suits. Um, there's our baby Blake. It costs four thousand quid now. Baby Blake, incredible. Um, oh, in a serious first aid kit. Uh, you're not going to get much help up there if you break a leg or something. So you need to get some um, dodgy painkillers of some kind. Um, we were lucky because we had Charlotte with us, um, Greenwich Yacht Club Charlotte, and she had access to um, to the strong stuff. So we're all um, we're all fitted out. We've got our kit. We're all super fit. We've done all our research. Um, so it's time to set off. So this is the Yan Mayan trip. The plan was to do the trip over three years. Um, the objective of the first year was to have a shakedown cruise and leave the boat in Scotland. Now, because I'm a bit of a fan of Norway, I decided we'd go up to Stonehaven and then across to Bergen, um, just for a bit of cruising around here. And then we came back via the Shetlands, uh, Fair Isle, back down through and left the boat in in Oban. Um, so the um, yeah well I, and of course the second the second year was going to be the Yan Mine trip up and back and then the third year was going to be a trip back around the rest of the coast to bring the boat back to back to London. Um, <clears throat> when we left the boat after the first year in Dunstaffnage wintered there went back in the water and then a rather strange thing happened. Um, yeah, hurricane force winds hit the marina. Um, and this was just before we were due to leave. So my boat is, is there. Um, there were 180 boats were damaged. I think 12 boats sunk, not, not in the marina. Um, uh, yeah, you can see it was pretty, um, it was pretty violent. But the, the amazing thing was that absolutely nothing at all happened to Samara. It, it, um, 
it was quite unbelievable. It didn't get a scratch of varnish, and no ropes chaffed, no eyelets blew out of the cover. Whoops. Um, and there wasn't even a drop of water in the bilge. It was it was uncanny. But it was it was a bloody close shave. However, the important thing is um, you just cannot fail on a trip trip like this because even if the boat had sunk, um, you've already been on this amazing climbing trip up in the Cheviots, you've been walking in the Brecon Beacons, you've been running marathons, you've been climbing in the Alps, you've learned how to fillet a cod, um, you've got the basics of speaking Norwegian, you've read all about William Scoresby, you've met your best buddies for a beer in the pub, so it, it makes the thing worthwhile even without doing the thing. So you, you just can't go wrong. It's like once you've started, the excitement of, and the joy of planning and training is really part of the trip. So even without the trip, this all would have been worthwhile. Still, we didn't sink. Um, so we were ready to set off from Oban north to the Faroes. So up through here. Um, and then on to Yan Mine up here. Um, and at, at the time of planning, it didn't seem unreasonable to try and go over to Scoresby Sund afterwards. Um, and then while, ooh, hang on. And then while we were up there, we were going to call in in Iceland and visit the Westman Islands and, and come back. Um, <clears throat> now, there are a couple of reasons why not to do this Yan Mayan trip and one of them is that Birenberg is actually an active volcano. It, it went off in 1973, it went off again in 1984, so it is overdue. It's the world's most northerly volcano, it's Norway's only active one and it is massive. It, it actually goes down under the water for 2,000 meters and it comes up, and this is the answer to your question, it comes up 2,277 metres above the water. And, and of course it's even bigger in feet. But, um, the crater is actually a kilometre across and the, the circumference at sea level is 70 kilometres. Um, you need to be pretty fit to climb Burenberg because it, it's covered in glaciers with deep, deep crevasses. There are no guidebooks um, and there are no shops to buy anything if you leave anything behind. Certainly no, no Sherpas. But probably the worst thing of all, the most difficult thing of all about this trip, is um, there are no anchorages, no safe anchorages. Um, the Admiralty pilot said mean winds of 124 knots with extreme gusts of 159 knots have been recorded with violent catabatic squalls occurring on the flanks of Beerenberg. Wow. Um, the sea temperature um, hovers around three degrees, although, although to be fair it goes up to 30 degrees um, during the eruptions. The uh, fog frequency, even in July, is 20%. There are no rescue facilities on Yan, Yan Mine, and the island's outside helicopter range, um, and it, it's got no, no lifeboats. Getting permission to climb Beerenberg is, um, is very difficult, and, um, and now they've made it even harder. It's, it's almost impossible to get the right um, permissions to climb. And, and the final reason why you might not, might not go is um, the great Bill Tillman had a go at climbing Beerenberg and he lost his pilot cutter mischief in the process. Still, what the hell, um, <clears throat> whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has power, genius and magic. Goethe. 
So that's, that's exactly what we did. Um, so we set off um, from the Faroes, uh, set off from Ullapool. Um, we held a really nice southerly wind for a while um, until it turned against us. Um, and then it was a bit of a struggle getting into Torshaven, the, the capital of the Faroes. Faroes, you have to be wary of extremely violent tides. Um, it's an old map I've got and it, it shows the Monk's Rock Whirlpool which is the southern tip of the Faroes and this map the Monk's Rock Whirlpool has got the same amount of importance as you know the map of Iceland. But, um, the tides are really hard to work out in the Faroes or they used to be and they, they're kind of based on the moon's meridian passage over a, a rock called Little Demon. Um, it's all explained reasonably clearly in a little blue book that you can buy from the newsagent in Torshaven, but, um, but you have to get there first. But actually, uh, it's not quite as bad as it was because the, um, the CA now produce an excellent um, pilot guide um, written by Michael Henderson, and it's got links in there to modern apps that um, so you can actually find out about these tides a bit easier. So <clears throat> there is a little way through the islands here, a kind of dodgy shortcut. Torshaven is just here. Um, and there's this rather tricky passage between Estroy and Stremoy. The tide runs at about 12 knots. So if you get it wrong, um, it, it would be bye bye to the boat. There's also a restricted air draft because there's a bridge going across and it's shallow underneath. So um, timing is pretty crucial to do that trip. This is Tim's boat. He was joining the trip. Um, so this is him sailing up into the fair. Actually, it's a previous photo, but it is in the Faroes, I think. Um, Tim built the boat himself, 35 foot long, very spacious. Um, well, certainly compared to my boat. Um, he built it about 17 years ago. Um, there was a third Icelandic boat involved who, which brought Charlotte, that's Greenwich Yacht Club's Charlotte, um, out to Jan Main from, from Iceland. Alistair, yep. again, sorry to interrupt, but yep. it's uh, about eight o'clock now, so people oh, uh, okay. will want to be clapping in a few seconds. <laughs> I whistle. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, well, let's have a little break for, um, for three or four minutes and, um, yeah, get, get out and get, get clapping. Okay. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, there's my dog. Oh, they're all gone. <laughs> all still out there. <laughs>
How's it going, Jessica? Yeah, good. Uh, we clapped and I topped up the wine again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need it. <laughs> How is, are that, you? You all, is the volume all okay and everything? And yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of instances where very briefly it went sort of all robotic, but okay. like really briefly, uh, yeah, you, do, you wouldn't miss the words at all. Mm. So, no, that's very good. Well, let's see what happens in these videos. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, have you connected on the Ethernet cable? Well, no, because it didn't make any difference. Okay, fine. Yeah, but uh, we think it might have been slow because Grit was logged on as well. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 that's possible. Well, we'll see here. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, I'll mute again because. <coughs> Are we all here? Alistair, it's really interesting and it's amazing to see your boat in such fantastic condition in the photographs. Yeah, well, I, hopefully she's going to be even better now because she's having a refit in Alapur. Well, so, it looks um, like a really much loved boat. It's very Yeah, lovely. no, she is. Yeah, yeah. I quite enjoy varnishing, which is a good job. <laughs> certainly is. Yeah. It was stripped back this year, so and we, we were up in Scotland varnishing just before the lockdown, and then we had to come back. So, mm. should we get going? Are we all back? Do you think? Quite a few people seem to be back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Alistair, that's fine. Yeah. Let's uh, carry on. Okay. Great. Um, right, this is Tors Harbin, uh, capital of Pharaohs, with Tembi um, and Sumara moored up alongside. So we had a little kind of last minute planning meeting with um, all, all the crew aboard Tembi before Sumara was going to set off through the that dodgy gap in the morning. Now we've got some videos. They didn't work all that well the other day. They kind of buffered up a little bit, um, but we're going to give it a go. I hope they do work because um, th this is just a little short one of the trip through the um, through the narrow passage. So let's hope it. I thought I'd got rid of this slide. This is a, a rather weird artist's impression of um, Jan Mine. Very imaginative. Um, so this was um, our ooh, go back. This is our trip around the North Cape of um, Jan Mine down here. And we anchored in this bay here called Kalfas Bukta. Um, we'd, we'd logged 550 nautical miles. Um, we'd motored for 33 hours, been at sea for six and a half days. Um, we anchored in eight metres. You can see that the anchorage is um, completely exposed to any wind coming from the west. Um, the whole island's 30 miles long. There's a base station down here. I think, what is it here? Maybe here. Um, and then there's another anchorage up here called Stasiunsbukta. Um, and, and B 
Berenberg is here. It's interesting that um, more people climb um, Everest in a day than have ever climbed Berenberg. Um, so the landscape on the island is pretty lunar. NASA once considered it for training their um, astronauts but concluded it was too severe. There's, there's a kind of partial covering of um, grey moss and even the odd alpine flower survives. There are no polar bears on Yan Mine, which is good news. Um, <laughs> immediately. Alistra? Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we, I, I think we missed the last bit. The mic went all weird. If oh, you could it? say that again, just the last sort of five seconds or so. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just saying because the because the weather was it was really calm when we arrived. We were really lucky. We decided it was a good opportunity to to climb immediately. Um, does that cover the bit that you missed? Yeah. Any case, I'm sure you'll catch up. So the boat was in a state of, although we were really organised to begin with, of course, at the actual point when we decided to do the climb, we found that um, it was chaos. Never mind. Um, it was a mad scramble getting all our gear together. <clears throat> So there are the three yachts at anchor in Stasiensbukta. Um, you can see the size and kind of guess the weight of these, of these waterproof bags. Um, yeah, that is pretty important to keep everything in waterproof bags because if you get salt water onto a sleeping bag or something in, in these kind of temperatures, um, it would be a pretty kind of serious thing to do. There wouldn't be any way of drying it out. So we, we climbed 500 metres um, to set up a base camp carrying all that gear. Um, and the reason we decided to have a base camp is because we thought base camp would be fun. Um, it did provide some logistical advantage as well, but um, we just wanted a base camp. Um, so we're now in the cloud level and um, and I've been told it was very cold, although I don't tend to feel the cold much. Um, clothing on the trip, the these belay jackets are fantastic. Um, this is a mountain equipment one, I had a rab one. Best to avoid goose down, goose down if you can. Um, if it gets wet it's a bit of a nightmare. Um, there's a material called Prima Loft, and there's an outer skin called um, Pertex Endurance, and that the combination of those two provides a really warm jacket that you can put on to keep the chill out. But uh, the real miracle fibre that um, that we used was a fibre called wool. Um, it's without a doubt the best thing to wear. The merino thermals are just unbelievable. Um, they, um, they don't smell, you don't sweat in them, they keep you warm. You can wear them for weeks on end without changing them. Um, they're just perfect. So it would be a top tip of mine, wear wool. Um, so from the um, from the base camp, we climbed up to this. This is called a nun attack. It, a nun attack is a, a rocky outcrop that bursts through a glacier. Um, now, below the nun attack, uh, the, the surface is quite kind of smooth, so the glaciers don't tend to get crevasses in them. But when you go above the nun attack, um, the, the land is much more uneven and you get really big deep crevasses. Um, so we're about to move into kind of pretty serious crevasse territory. We've got a little video of the, the climb up to the summit which I hope works okay for you.
What's the date? The date is the 8th of August. Best. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, it's not time for a break because we just had one. Um, so we left um, we left the island after spending about five days there. So it was three years planning for five days. Um, and our intention, ooh, go back. Our intention was to sail across to Scoresby Sund, um, but the ice conditions were, were it was just no chance. It was all fast ice up here. Um, so then our plan B was to sail down to Amaskalik, which is down here, um, and there's a means of getting back to Iceland by plane for one of the crew. Um, but in fact the ice was fast pretty much down the whole of the coast. And, it, and the whole thing about sailing to East Greenland became pretty irrelevant because it was blowing a kind of heavy gale from that direction. So both Tembi and Sumara decided that we would um, head down to the west fjords of, of Iceland. It's a lovely cruising area here and we were going to Isafordur. Um, so our um, Icelandic friend um, Siggy had, had mentioned that the ice often clears in, ooh, sorry, clears from the in the center of the Greenland coast. This is quite common this little patch here going up to a place called Kangalusak 
So this was Scoresby Sund where we hoped to go to originally. This was a masculine, both blocked by ice. But this area was clearing. Um, so we thought we'd, we'd maybe give it, give it a go. Um, we received these ice charts from a satellite phone, but they had to be turned into GIFs to reduce the resolution before they were sent to us. We needed someone on shore to send them to the sat phone. Um, we weren't going to risk going in here with just this kind of gap and all this ice around, but the hope was that if we sailed across, by the time we got there, it might have cleared and we'd be able to um, um, make the approach. So we took um, Goethe's advice and we began it. Um, well, we, we met ice pretty much where the ice chart said the ice would be. We met it actually in thick fog. Um, it was pretty hard, you know, even a few yards from Tembi, you couldn't see. It did clear eventually and Tembi managed to get this nice picture. Um, but we received a weather forecast for a, a strong storm um, about to arrive in a couple of days. And we thought, well, this is no place to be playing around in the ice. So we decided it's time to scarper. Um, <clears throat> so we headed down to, so from the ice out here, we headed down to this place called Olafsvik. And we went there because we thought it would give us an opportunity to climb this volcano here. It's called Snaefels Jurkatal. And it's where Jules Verne's based his journey to the centre of the earth. Um, luckily, the port of Olafsvik was a nice snug port because the wind arrived as, as predicted. Um, but despite the wind, we decided we would set off and make an attempt to climb Snaefels Jurkatal. So this is the uh, crazy summit photo. Um, <clears throat> um, it was a good little climb, but um, yeah, a bit bizarre and visibility and wind like that. So we headed off down back into Olafsvik and then we decided it was time to head to Reykjavik to make our journey home. Um, this is a funny little photo of Charlotte in the middle. Um, it's, um, it's obvious that we're contravening Rule 5 of the collision regulations because there are only three of us on board and um, doesn't seem to be anyone keeping a lookout. Never mind. So the final part of the journey, we sailed away from Reykjavik down to the Westman Islands. Um, it was a fairly hairy journey, um, but we did manage to get into the Westman Islands where I blew up my gearbox. Um, so we had to sail back to Scotland. This part of the Icelandic coast is diabolically inhospitable. So it's just, you've just got to steer well clear of it. And of course, if you tune into the shipping forecast, you know that the, um, the permanent phrase in the shipping forecast is, and the regales in South East Iceland. And they're not wrong. Um, just on a, a bit of a sad note, um, my Icelandic crew um, on the way back, Gudrun, one of the fittest people I knew, um, died of cancer last year. And a few years before, my friend Peter, who is a popular crew on Sumara, and invented the bacon and banana sandwich, um, probably the cause of his cancer. Um, any case, I, I just point out we don't live forever. And if you're thinking of doing one of these grand adventures, um, take Goethe's advice and begin it. Um, any case, as we were sailing back to Scotland, of course, I was browsing through the pilot book. And once again, I was intrigued by the prospect of Scoresby Sund. So Scoresby Sun was definitely going to need a visit. So when Will Sterling phoned me to ask if I'd like to join him on a trip there, um, obviously there was one answer. So I headed off to Husavik, on the north coast of Iceland, to join his yacht Integrity. 
Um, <laughs> beautiful yacht. Um, Will built this boat on spec in the hope of selling her for um, half a million or so. But sadly, no buyers were willing to um, put up with the hard graft involved in sailing these kind of boats. So Will decided to make use of the yacht uh, with a series of quite ambitious Arctic voyages. Um, th these boats are, are definitely hard work to sail. To get the top sail up, um, you actually have to hoist this spar up first, uh, which is pretty hard work. Um, and then and then you have to steady this spar with with shrouds and chains. So you have to add five loads of chains onto the ends of the wires. Um, and then you have to add blocks and tackles onto the ends of the chains. And then all you've got is the spar up. So then you have to get out the top sail and then you have to get the top sail up. And of course, if the wind picks up a little bit, you have to get the whole lot back down again. Um, but pretty hard work, but um, it's certainly a very beautiful boat. Now, Will, Will is an interesting character. He's, a, he's apparently a direct descendant from Nelson. Um, he seems to lack any sense of fear, which um, makes him a, an intriguing skipper. So there he is, there's Will. He, he, he doesn't partake in yachting clothing, just wears whatever, whatever comes to hand. Um, so the original plan was to sail um, from the north coast of Iceland. We were, we were kind of around here. He's on top of Greg on my screen. <laughs> um, up kind of pretty much north to Scoresby Sund. And then we were going to circumnavigate this island here. It's called Milne Land. Um, and, and then sail back probably to the West Field. So that was our original original plan but sadly we were too early once again um, and the ice hadn't cleared so we had to revert to a plan b and plan b um, was once once again to head down to a mascalic it was our first plan b um, now will had sensibly bought a rifle um, for bear protection um, possibly less sensibly, it had it sent direct to Scoresby soon. So um, the fact that we were no longer heading to Scoresby soon posed a, a bit of a problem. Um, winters in Iceland um, really take their toll on yachts and there was a fair bit of work to do before setting off. But after a couple of days of hard graft, um, we managed to get underway. We did two hour watches um, single handed. Um, you have to hang on to the helm all the time because um, it's got a, a very heavy weather helm. Um, even under motor, it's got a, a kind of motor helm. Um, Dan was a great asset on board because he was a fantastic fisherman and he kept us constantly supplied with, um, with large cod um, and, and indeed other fish. Um, so we sailed along the north coast of Iceland. Um, for a while we did it under square sail, which is a first for me. And um, it was really pretty good sail actually. Um, worth trying to work out a way of getting a square sail up on my yacht, I think. Um, Will's keen on using all old stuff. Um, so he was using a sextant to navigate. Um, that wasn't so successful in the fog. And there's also a little bit of doubt um, regarding the deviation table that we did just before we left Husevik, or no, just after we left Husevik. Um, we, up there you get like 20 degrees variation and you get 20 degrees deviation. You, you, you stand a chance of um, going quite a long way off route. In any case, we were mildly alarmed um, when out of the fog, this picture doesn't quite sum it up, but you're basically sailing in thick fog and then you look up in the air and you see cliffs. So we were pretty near the um, 
top of Iceland and we weren't quite expecting to be. So it was a swift 90 degree um, swing to port, but at least we got a fix, we knew where we were. In any case, after a couple of days sailing, we stopped off in a little port called Suderoy in the West Fjords to refuel. Um, and then we headed off to uh, Iceland. Um, it wasn't long before we saw bergs, we saw them a bit sooner than we expected. Um, but when we saw this one with a hole in it, uh, well, there was only one thing that we could do. Bumpy through that. Bloody hard to tell. Yeah, go for it. not a particularly safe thing to do. Um, so this is the area that we were heading for down here around Amaskalik. Um, we were probably out here playing with these bergs. Um, this, this is the main settlement. Our original, well, our plan was to go into these fjords and work our way through these little bits, um, but the fog was so Dense that we decided it would just be pointless A because we couldn't see anything and B because we'd probably get lost. Um, so we decided to head straight for the main, the main settlement. Uh, there are various little settlements that serve off the main settlement, very small, maybe a hundred people around here and here and here kind of thing. Um, as you get further up the coast they, they disappear. So the chance of coming across bears gets more and more the further up here you go. Um, around here the bears are wary of people with guns, up here they're uh, a little bit less so. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't visit Greenland for its towns. Um, the, there was a massive supermarket in this, in this town, it was really pretty impressive. Um, and it sold rifles and it sold ammunition. Um, and indeed, we could have hired it, but we would have needed to brought it back. We eventually made the decision to go unarmed. Um, this is because buying a gun was going to be a lot of expense, especially as Will had already bought a gun and sent it to Scoresby Sund. And B, we were keen not to come back here with a gun because the, the weather forecast that we were receiving indicated that we needed to get as much north in as we could, um, otherwise we'd be beating into it all the way back to Iceland. So it would be a shame to go north up the coast and then come lose all of that north we'd gained. So we set off um, unarmed. Um, this is a little settlement you see in the distance there called Tinikilina. Um, Funny enough, the pilot books are all pretty weird around here. You might find this new one by Michael Henderson's probably the best bet because he's been there and he's been plotting the stuff, with his own echo sounder. The, the pilot book we had on board meant, showed that this wasn't passable at all. 
Um, we did touch on the way in, um, or hit a rock as they say, um, but these kind of having a shallow entrance into a bay is really good news because it keeps the icebergs out so that you know if you can just get into a bay it's absolutely perfect because those bergs have got a lot of draft to them and they won't get in but the reason we touched um, was because we didn't have someone up in the spreaders and if we had someone aloft they would have seen the rock easily because the water is absolutely crystal clear um, so um, William Scoresby in fact invented the crow's nest this is one from the Whitby, Whitby Museum but um, it, it is a top tip to try and get someone aloft uh, halfway up the mast or you could use a drone but I, I'm not saying that's ideal really because um, they don't last all that long and you need someone up there for quite a long time. Um, getting someone up the mast of a virtue it's going to be a little bit tricky but I'm working on it. Um, so we progress through these little inner passages um, up the East Greenland coast um, and we arrived in this bay called Storo. You can see the bergs outside that we were navigating through so we, um, we kind of came up through here dodging these things and we came in and you felt relatively safe in here because these bergs had gone aground in the entrance. Um, so that's that's actually a view of Storo. Ooh, hang on. Ooh, that's a view of Storo, and you can see, um, you know, it's almost a perfect kind of anchorage. This is my hunting knife here, by the way. Um, my splendid Arthur Beale pullover. <laughs> um, any case, we had a plan that if we were going to get attacked by a bear. Well, I must admit this is not a good plan. Um, we took an oar with us so that's why we're carrying an oar up a mountain um, and the idea is one person would hit the bear on the head with the oar and I would climb on its back with my knife. Um, <laughs> I think um, that was a bit fanciful really but you, you can see out to sea the amount of ice that's building up off the coast and this, we had to get out of here dig out the coast afterwards so it's a little bit worrying. This chap's a guy called Gino Watkins um, who was one of Britain's great explorers. Uh, he did the air arctic route um, uh, very successfully a, a route across Greenland overland which um, it was called an air route because you had to walk if an aeroplane was going to fly anywhere in the world someone had to be able to walk the route underneath so before they could open up the route across Greenland for the flight uh, this chap had to go across for the team to open up the route. In any case so he was a, chose his equipment really wisely. Um, here we are at Arthur Beale we have this um, telegram from Watkins signed at the bottom saying please send 300 foot alpine lines to British expedition Amaskalik Greenland via Gertrude Rusk leaving Copenhagen July the 1st send account Captain Rainer Mountsback Aldershot England Watkins. So there you go. great taste Blown throat from a fine shop in Shaftesbury Avenue. Um, he bought his boat off another one of our customers Ernest Shackleton um, so this is Shackleton's old boat and in fact we anchored in this same fjord as he did. The glacier is not as big now as it was. So this is us in the same fjord. Um, quite a lot of ice around there. Do you know Watkins actually got lost kayaking from this, this fjord? I think he was hunting seals so it's not an idea to do that by yourself. Um, one other advantage of having survival suits on board is that you can take a swim out to a nearby iceberg and uh, enjoy a quiet drink away from the crowds. So we anchored at various amazing spots up the coast but increasingly the fjords were getting blocked off by ice completely and um, 
So the time came for us to head further north. We had to now head out away from the coast to try and make, make some north in. Um, yeah, quite a bit of ice around. Um, it was hard work weaving through, through this ice. Um, eventually, after many hours of painstaking left and right, and here's a bit, there's a bit pushing the ice away, we decided um, as it was quite calm, we would stop, um, stop for the night. So we actually tied up onto a berg, um, um, tied up for the night. We did set a night watch. Um, it's an unusual safety feature for Will. <laughs> um, it did get pretty serious at times. So the bergs would drift in. And you've got to bear in mind that underneath these bergs, you know, there's eight times as much ice underneath the water as there is on top. So this one coming in from the side could easily weigh a million tons. Um, so it was, um, yeah, it was a little bit, little bit dodgy. They roll over quite often as well, which um, if this berg here had rolled over, it would simply have lifted us up and tipped us in the air. This is Will with a pole, just feeling for the, the edge, the lip under to check that um, it wasn't going to come too close to the boat. The boat was copper plated um, from the waterline down. That wouldn't have provided much defence against ice, but um, saves on anti-fouling. The boat's completely traditionally made. The decks are all um, planked and tarred, drip accordingly. <laughs> Um, there's a fair bit of wildlife around. Um, there were seals and there were bears nearby. To um, this is a view from the boat when we were tied up on that um, on that berg. To check the ice conditions further out to sea because we were worried that if you know if the ice was any thicker, we wouldn't be able to get get away at all. We'd be um, embayed. So it's decided that. Um, three of the crew would go over to this nearby island in the dinghy called Sondra of Putatek um, and climb the island to get a view out to sea to see how the ice was further out. As this is quite a risky thing to do um, without a gun. Um, any case, guess what they found on the top of the island? Yep, the bear. Not sure if he's asleep or dead, to be honest, but um, any case, gave him a fright enough to make a very, very, very rapid descent. Um, so it was decided that this was really getting a bit out of order and it's time to, um, time to leave. That's brilliant. It's, um, it's quite tricky pushing the boat through. You, you don't really want to reverse up into the ice in case you hit the prop up against the ice and break the prop. Um, and we had a few worries about getting back to Iceland. We were running short of diesel. We've, we've got 400 litres of fuel. Um, uses a litre per nautical mile. And um, we'd used a good lot going in and out of those fields. Um, but um, as it happened, we did get a good old blow. Um, and um, yeah, as as we were sailing back, I had another little browse through the pilot book. And um, and in the pilot book, of course, I spotted Scoresby Sundergain, which still needs to be done. So that's the end of today. I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs> Any questions? Is it